If you have your Bibles with you, paper or electronic, would you turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and beginning in verse 23. In the NIV, you'll see the title over this section, The Believer's Prayer. And today we're calling it Bold Prayer, part of our series in the book of Acts, The Church Alive. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. Going back to verse 23, it says they went back to their own people. After everything had happened, once they were released, they were free to go anywhere. Where did they go? When you're free from a problem, freed from, from some situation, where is the place that you go when you are free to go anywhere? It's so exciting that they chose to go back to the community. And in your notes there, put community, and maybe you want to put also church. They went back to the community. They went back to the people of God. They went back to family and friends, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where they chose to go. The community, the church, the friends, families, the followers of Jesus Christ. It ought to be, sometimes we fail at that, but it ought to be that place of affection, that place of confidence, that place we know that we're going to get support. And Peter and John knew that they, in the company of believers, in the community of believers, they would have that support. God has prepared for you a family. And we, as a family, meet here at IEC in Addis. And the family of Christ is meeting in many places across Addis and even around the world. Early this morning, I got a text from a pastor in Tanzania as he was preparing for services and praying for me and praying for you, praying for us, that we'd have a blessed day in the presence of the Lord. The family is gathering on that side. They're far, but today we've gathered as family. And sometimes it really does feel like family, and then there are other times when it takes a little bit of work. It's not a perfect family. Yeah, okay. I'm glad it wasn't loud amens. <laughs> but we recognize we're not a perfect family, and all you need to do is look forward, and you see imperfection. But we are family. We're brothers. We're sisters. And we need to get along. We need to grow in God. We need to encourage one another in God. And we need to be like that community that received Peter and John, received them there and were a blessing to them. They surrounded them with love and care. The local church, here we are, a local church has already been said, we're an international church because we've come from the corners of the world and we've come from all over Ethiopia. But we've come as the body of Christ and we call IEC home and we are family right here. We're fed here together. We're challenged together. We're protected together, we're guided, and we mature together. We cannot live, we must not live in isolation. Church the size of IEC, it's easy 
to just come in at 11, 14 and a half. And it's really easy to leave quickly at the end of the service. But I would encourage you to come early. Come and get to know the people around you. Come early and pray together. Come early and worship the Lord together. And stay late. Stay late and shake hands. Stay late and be a part of the conversations that are so valuable. Stay late and be a part of that family. When we know one another, when we love one another, we care for one another, we'll take time for one another to share those burdens. We need to be family. I look out at you and I think, wow, what an amazing family that God has put me in here in Addis. And how I am grateful for each of you, grateful for your love, for your encouragement. But we need to continue to grow together. God is our Father, and that makes us brothers and sisters. And I love this, and I have many brothers and many sisters, and they certainly don't all look like me. Some of them have got dark skin. Some of them, if you can believe, have even lighter skin than I have. Of different mothers, for sure, but one father. I have that family in China, and I have family in South Africa, and I have family in France. I may not even speak the languages of my family, but they're family. Friends of mine were in Europe, and they stood in front of a cathedral. They didn't know the language, and they wondered, should we go in? It's the family of God. And they asked each other, should we... We won't know the language, we won't know the procedure, we won't know anything that's going on in there. And then they looked at each other and they said, what would David do? And then they said, you know, David would just go in and worship because this is family. And I was so excited when they told me after their, after their journey that they went in and they met family. They worshiped the Lord together. They heard the, the, the rhythm of the liturgy. And though they didn't understand the words, they lifted up their hearts in worship to God because they were together with family. It was extended family for sure, but they were together with family. But how beautiful that we can come together on a Sunday morning. We can support one another. We can hear about the week that we have had. We can share those things, and we share it with family, with brothers and with sisters. Sometimes maybe our brothers and our sisters embarrass us. You have that situation? Yeah, some of you are laughing already. Oh, my sister. Oh, she always embarrasses me. Oh, my brother. Why does he do that? Every time we're seen in public, he does something and he embarrasses me. But you know, he's still your brother. Amen? He's still your sister. Amen? At the end of the day, Sometimes we say we're embarrassed, but we like the attention they give us. We love how they love us and how they care for us. And we as a family, that's the way we must be. We must be the place where we want to get together on Sunday morning. Not where we look at the clock and say, oh, I guess I ought to go this morning. I guess I better get down. But we get up in the morning on Sunday and we say, yes. We're getting together with the family. There's a big family celebration on, and that's where I'm going today, to be with the family. As soon as they were released, Peter and John went to the family. They went to the church. They went to the people of God. We are the household of God. Romans 8, 16 and 17 talks about us being the children of God, joint heirs. Look around. These are the children of God. How blessed we are to gather as this family in this local church. 1 John 3 and verse 16, it says, This is how we know love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Amen? Oh, Lots of you ready. But are we really ready to lay down our lives for our brothers, for our sisters? 
Are we really ready to invest in the family of God? This morning, we've been appreciating the worship team, one of the ministries of IEC, and such a valid and, a, and an important and so visible, this ministry that each of them perform. But some of you, I've sat near you, and you've got voices, voices that could also help us on a Sunday morning. I've heard and I've seen some of you practicing on these pianos, and you can play, but we don't see you here on Sunday morning. We say amen when I ask, are you ready, willing to lay down your life for your brother, for your sister? And you said amen. We need you to invest in the family of God. There's so many things that happen here at IEC day by day, and we need you. We need you to be here to be a part, supporting, investing in the family of God, making sure things are ready, making sure things are done, so that when the family gathers, everything is set. When you call a family gathering in your home, do you take 10 minutes for preparation? Or do you get up early that morning? Oh, they're getting here. I tell you, the fire is started. The food is on. Today I'll be with a family, and I know they've been cooking since yesterday. Because the family is getting together. Friends are coming together. And they get ready. They get busy. And they prepare. Sunday doesn't happen by accident. It goes with preparation. All of us can have a part in that preparation. Be here early. Help. Assist. Set up. Be here on Saturday for worship. Be here on those prayer times. We'll talk more about prayer in a few minutes. Supporting the family. So we say, yes, yeah, I'm ready to will, willing to lay down my life. But the family needs you on a daily basis. Not necessarily giving up your life, but for sure, sacrificing, investing in the family. As we do that more and more, we'll be known as that family that loves one another. The scripture even talks about that. How will they know that you're my disciples? They'll know it from your love for one another. I just love the greetings here in Ethiopia. We draw each other close and we greet. How wonderful it is. But you also know strangers. Strangers who just have their hands reached out. But family draws close. They'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And it is you who brings that encouragement, that fellowship. Together we learn, we have that wisdom, maturity. There's a security when we have that family around us. But there's also an accountability. Someone this morning after the, after the first service said, Oh, I saw you yesterday. And I thought, oh, okay, so where did you see me? And then I was thinking, did you see me at graduation in the morning? Did you see me at Mechanisa when I was walking? Did you see me at Gabrielle in front of the church? Did you see me at a shop? Where did you see me? And not that there was anything that they shouldn't have seen, but I wondered, where did you see me? But you know, sometimes we see someone and we wonder what we really saw. I don't know if I ever told you the story about a senior pastor and his wife. Well, well, the senior pastor came on Sunday morning and found there was a great scandal in the church and everyone was talking about his wife. So he began to ask people, so what's going on here? Oh, they said, Pastor, your reputation is spoiled. And he said, why? Because of your wife. What has my wife done? Well, she smokes. And he's thinking, what? <laughs> she smokes? Oh, yes, people have seen your wife smoking. And so your testimony is really spoiled now because how can the senior pastor's, pastor's wife be seen in town and smoking? It was a scandal. And he chased the thing down and kept going and going and digging deeper to find out who saw his wife smoking. He knows his wife and she doesn't smoke. But someone has seen her smoking brought it all the way down to one place where someone was walking by a window and they looked in, the wife was having her hair done 
and they say she was inside the hair salon having a smoke. But in fact, she wasn't in there having a smoke. She was working on a word puzzle, and she had a white pen. I got a blue pen today. And she would work on the puzzle, and then she'd put the pen in her mouth. <laughs> she'd look at the puzzle a little more, and then she'd... But a member of the church walked by, looked in. Oh, the pastor's wife smokes. So instead of waiting for her and asking her about her cigarette habit, they go spreading rumors. We need to be a people who are mature, who love each other, care for each other. And when we think we saw something, we don't go spreading a rumor. We go back to the source and find out. Well, good enough, that brother who stopped me between the services said, I saw you yesterday. He saw me at Amman's graduation. It was a good place. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't nervous where he saw me. I knew my day yesterday. Everything was good. But together we get together for encouragement, to support one another. And here beautifully, Peter and John, where do they go? They go to church. They get together with the people of God. Peter asked his, or, sorry, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock, on this truth, on this statement, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We may have some shaking. <coughs> and even later in the service, in this message, you'll hear more about some shaking. We may get some shaking along the way. But let me tell you, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. As governments come, as governments fall, whatever the state of the economy around the world, whatever goes on, the gates of hell will never prevail against Christ's church. Amen? And that promise is for us as a congregation. The gates of hell will never prevail against us as we stand together in unity, one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, and they reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said. And I'm sure they reported what they had said as well. They told what happened, and they talked about their courage that came from Christ as they proclaimed the name of the Lord. But what happened when they heard this? When they heard this, verse 24, they raised their voices. They raised their voices, but did they complain? Did they decide, oh, we must do this, we must unite, we must make a plan, we must speak against these guys, we need to go to the community and rally and turn everyone against the Sanhedrin? Is that what it says? No. It says the community prayed. They went back to the community, and the community prayed in response. What a beautiful thing. They didn't defend, they didn't attack, they didn't, they didn't critique, but instead they responded in prayer. How we must learn to pray. We do pray, and we have learned to pray, but how we need to learn to pray even more and to pray better. They responded in prayer. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. They prayed in unison. They prayed together. They raised their voices. Prayer is not the time for us to check out. Prayer is not the time to write a note. Prayer is not the time to check our cell phones unless we're turning them off. And every now and then I think, oh, is the ringer on? Is the ringer off? The safest place for my phone to be is in my drawer, not in my pocket on Sunday morning. That way, if it rings, there's nobody who hears it. But so often, we say, let us pray. And immediately, people start fidgeting. They go checking on this, checking on that. Some people go for a little walk. I don't know where they go. Do you know where they go? They disappear during prayer. I open my eyes after amen, and I look. They're gone. How did it happen? I didn't pray them away, but they disappeared. We had this idea that prayer is this little break in the service where we can walk away, we can do something, we can send a note, we can pay attention to something. 
But prayer is a time for us to be together. To be in unison. It says they raise their voices to God in prayer together. We're here at IEC. We have our IEC culture. And it's a little quieter than some cultures. Quieter than some churches. But you know, it's okay to lift our voices in prayer. It's okay to say amen as someone is praying. It's okay to say yes, Lord, as someone is praying and agree with that prayer. It's okay to lift your voices. They raised their voices in prayer to God. And I would encourage you. And I know you do it in your heart, and some of you do it. And as I lead in prayer, I love to hear someone say, yes, yes, yes. You're agreeing, you're listening, and you become a part of that prayer. Raise your voices. Make sure that you also talk to God in that time of prayer. Don't just leave someone up front here to say a prayer on your behalf. But be involved in that prayer. Be a part of that prayer. Say yes. Hey, say amen along the way. And then together as we finish up, make sure there's a strong amen. And that tells all of us that we're together in that prayer. Prayer pulls us together. We need to be a people of prayer, but a people that that pray together as well. (coughs) When it comes time for our prayer times, when we gather, at times outside of a Sunday morning, we need to be that people that come together and raise our voices to God in prayer. Participate in prayer. Raise your voice. Let's pray together. They were of one accord. They were one mind. They were united with one purpose. And let's take a few minutes to look at their prayer. First, they recognize the sovereignty of God. They begin in their prayer to God, Sovereign Lord. You are the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You are sovereign We need to remind ourselves. We don't need to remind God of anything. Do we need to remind him that he's the one who created the heaven and the earth? I don't think so. He knows it. But we need to remind ourselves and affirm who God is. He is the sovereign Lord. He is to be trusted. He is in charge. Amen? And we need to trust him in that. And they affirm again. They recognize the sovereignty of God. You're the creator of heaven and earth, the sea. There are no limits to your rule. You are in control. You're in control of that council which was just held. You're in control of life, in, uh, in control of death. We trust you. We have faith in you. We have complete confidence in you, sovereign Lord. You're in charge. You are good. Your mercy endures forever. And we sing that. How many times? Lord, you are good. And here they're saying, Sovereign Lord, you are good. And we can trust you with our lives. We recognize your authority. We recognize your rule. And then they go on and they recognize the knowledge of God. Verse 25. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Lord, you knew. And not only, excuse me, not only did you know, but you spoke by the Holy Spirit. You, through David, spoke to us. You warned us of what was going to happen. So you are not surprised. You are not surprised by this council. You are not surprised by the arrest of Peter and John. You knew all of this and you spoke it by David. He prophesied. And we have it. But how many times are we surprised? Here was God giving us a heads up. You preach the name of Jesus and people will rebel. People will gather together, even the kings of the earth, rulers of the earth, will come against you. Don't be surprised. 
It was recorded in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? The kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers making plots together. He gave us a heads up. And he's telling us, don't be surprised. And another reason, of course, why we gather as a community, because we learn together, we hear the word of God together, we talk about the word of God together. We share together, encourage each other, and, and we grow because of the word of God. And we see this example from, from Psalm 2, David's prophecy. It was there for a heads up so that we wouldn't be surprised at the situation we're going to get into. Some of you get together after the service and you talk about my tie wasn't straight, my jacket was undone, maybe my shirt was untucked, and maybe I wasn't eloquent, maybe I didn't say, say it well. And so you bring on indigestion in your lunchtime because you talk about everything that went wrong on Sunday morning. And I know. Any amens? Good. <laughs> I know because you've told me. And I think how sad. How sad we didn't stop and listen for God's voice. We didn't stop to hear what God was saying. And he uses imperfect people like me sometimes to speak it. And how sad when we miss what God was trying to say to us. But there's also others of you who from here you'll go and you'll get lunch and you'll talk together. What was God saying today? Did God say something to you? What did you hear from the book of Acts today? And you discuss and you encourage and you build up one another in community. That's what the church should be. Where we're listening for God's voice. And even with all of the imperfections, we're listening for God's voice. We're discerning what he's saying. Amen? And does he have a message for us? Does he have a, a message for us to help us to grow, to learn? We get that. And these people got it as they gathered together. They recognized the knowledge of God and the beauty of God in giving us his word so that we can have knowledge, knowledge of him, knowledge of the way that is there in front of us, that there's no mystery when the troubles come. We don't think, oh my goodness, what did I do this week that all these troubles came to me? But we recognize from the word of God, yeah, I should have seen this coming. I should have been more prepared for this because God's word told me it was coming. Amen? That's the beauty of family. That's the beauty of coming together. But you look how they prayed. First, they recognize the sovereignty of God. And then they affirm his knowledge that, lest Lord, you knew it. Though we didn't see it coming, but you saw it coming. And David's prophecy from... Psalm 2 is shared there, verses 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the heathen rage? Why did Rome rage? Why did Rome cooperate with the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why do the people plot? Why do they imagine these things? Why are they plotting against our Christ, the anointed one? Why do kings stand opposed and back in that day and through the centuries, we've seen governments come that are so opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on in verse 20, uh, 27. Indeed, indeed, even Herod and Pontius Pilate, they met together with the Gentiles, with the Romans. And the people of Israel right here in this city of Jerusalem to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus Christ. But then in verse 28, they go on and they recognize the power of God. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Again, Lord, you saw this coming. We didn't see it. We didn't recognize it. But it was in your power. These rulers, they came and they conspired against the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And they conspired to defeat him, to silence him, to stop him. They cried out, crucify him, crucify him. They crucified him, and then they said, it is finished. But it was Jesus who had the last word, and he said, yes, it's finished. You're trying to bury me, and you're trying to bury this message. You're trying to bury this gospel. But in fact, today, it is finished once and for all. The redemption of mankind for all of eternity, it's done. It's taken care of. And death and hell and sin are defeated in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he rose again, the grave did not hold him. Those soldiers could not keep him. They had to pay each other to tell stories about what had happened to the body of Jesus. But it wasn't a body that was, that was stolen, not a body that was taken. It was the resurrected Lord who walked out from the grave. Hallelujah. And they recognized the community as they pray together, the sovereignty, the knowledge, the power of God. And then they come with their requests, the community requests, the church requests. But you know, they don't ask for deliverance, they don't ask for favor, they ask for something else. <coughs> if you came to me with a story that was similar to Peter and John, oh, the prayer that I would pray would be so different than this prayer. I would have been praying against those guys in that council. Remember some of those Old Testament prayers, some of those imprecatory psalms? Oh, God, bring fire down on them. Oh, just as we hear the lightning and the thunder in Addis, Lord, send fire. Break that place where they meet. <coughs> Destroy that council. Oh, disrupt them. Amen? Is that the way you'd be praying too? When I hear the injustice done to you, oh, I would be praying against those people that did those things to you. God, get them and get them good. Lord, don't let their car start today. And if their car does start, let them have four flat tires. Oh, God, <coughs> get them. Lord, when they go to do business, don't let anyone do business with them. We want to defeat these guys. We want to destroy these guys. We hear the story of injustice. But what do they do? They pray, not for deliverance, not for favor, not for removal from the situation, not for removal of the Sanhedrin, but they pray for boldness to speak God's word. Hallelujah. Oh, how we must change the way we pray. We do. We'll pray some of those other prayers. And we will pray for favor and we'll pray for protection. But in this situation, when they heard the news, when they heard the story, they prayed for boldness, not just to be bold to stand up to this council, but boldness to preach the Word of God, to share the Word of God. Moses said to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. My brothers, my sisters, be strong and of good courage. Together, let's pray for boldness to take the name of Jesus in dark places. To take the name of Jesus where the name of Jesus is an unmentionable. Where he's not welcome, let's pray for that boldness to speak God's word. Boldness against the enemy. Boldness to keep God's law. Boldness to testify. Amen. And it continues on. The community, they request the boldness to speak God's word. And then they pray for wonders in the name of Jesus. Verse 29. 29 and 30. Consider their threats, but enable your, your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we want boldness to proclaim the name, but we want, to show, want you to show yourself in power, in wonder. We want you to stretch out your arm, stretch out your hand, and do wonders so that people would see and turn to the name of Jesus Christ. Stretch out your hand to heal, perform miraculous signs and wonders 
through the name of your holy servant. You know, the best way to get a crowd, I'm not sure here in Ethiopia, but Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, just put a sign up somewhere, signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. Seven o'clock tonight, and the place is packed. But you know, to me, I find it sometimes sad because it's about the signs and it's about the wonders. It's about the excitement. How many of you need a sign or a wonder today to serve the Lord? Good. Oh, we do. Okay, there's a few. But most of us don't. Because we have seen the signs, we've seen the wonders, and we've seen the wonder of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives, transforming us. We've seen the wonder of His salvation. We've seen the wonder of His forgiveness. And even today, we've been singing about it. Then sings my soul. When I think of God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. Wow. Oh, and then sings my soul. That's a sign and that's a wonder. We don't want to just create an excitement and signs and wonders for the sake of it. In fact, some people have said to me, oh, well, you know, I, um, certain people don't come to IEC. So tell me why they don't come. Because there are no signs and wonders. And I'm thinking, well, they must be blind. <laughs> because they're not seeing they're not seeing lives that are transformed. They're not seeing lives that are changed. They're not seeing people walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not hearing the testimonies of you going to your workplace, to going to your families and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So they're missing it. But maybe they want me standing on one foot and doing a wave. <laughs> hey, I did it. Whoa. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah, if I went down, who's going to see me in hospital this afternoon? But. But maybe we want something spectacular and all. We want signs and wonders. Why? Really, is it to bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what they were praying for. They said, God, we want you to move in your powerful way. We want you to touch the human heart. And yes, just like this lame man, and this is what caused this whole commotion. Here's this lame man when, they, when he asked Peter and John... Would you give me something so that I can get food for tonight? They said, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have, we'll give you in the name of Jesus. And they took his hand, and after 40 years of never walking on his own two feet, that man stood up, and he walked, and he jumped, and he went running through town, praising God. The signs and the wonders, it was about bringing people to God bringing people into the glory of God. And that was their prayer. Boldness to speak God's word. And then they're asking God, confirm your word. We'll have the boldness to preach it, but confirm your word in your work, in your sovereign way. And we need, just as we prayed here, the sovereignty of God. We need to trust him in the way that he's going to do it. Amen? Need to trust him that he is going to fulfill his word in power. Stretch out your hand. You're mighty to save. We've been singing about there's no one like you. You're the one that turns the water to wine. You are the one who opens the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. And that's what they're affirming here. There's a gather together in community. They pray. They recognize and, and affirm the sovereignty of God, the knowledge of God, the power of God, and they ask for boldness, and they ask for wonders. Show yourself. Show your power amongst us. Amen. Time is rushing, and we shall rush to verse 31, after they had prayed. What happens after we pray? After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. There was evidence that God had heard their prayer. There was a loud shaking. The building, wherever it was that they were meeting, was shaken, and they were all filled with Holy Spirit. It was like the day of Pentecost with a rushing mighty wind. It was tangible where God was expressing, I'm sure, I heard your prayer. 
and they had faith that God was going to act. Paul and Silas, as they prayed in jail, and we'll get to that in a number of chapters, as they were there in jail, even the jail shook. Wow. How those guards must have felt when the jail shook. But it was the power of God. And our last line in our notes there, prayer equals power in the Holy Spirit. Amen. We can't expect the power of God. We cannot expect the power of the Holy Spirit when we do not live according to the Word and where we do not pray in power, in faith, in expectation, and we pray in the Holy Spirit. They prayed, honoring God, expecting from God, and they heard from God in a very, very real way. Get ready, church. One day after one of our prayers, as we together say amen, get ready. You won't want to sit down, but you'll have to sit down because the place is going to shake and you'll fall into your chair. Okay, amen. You're ready. You're expecting. And the people across the street at King's Hotel, they may not feel it, but someone going by, they may look and say, wow, what's going on? What's going on at IEC today? Because it looks like the building is shaking. We got a good building, strong building, very well built, good foundation. But expect it to shake with the power of God. Not for your excitement or for my excitement, but God showing his power. Amen? Houses shaken. Churches awakened, enemies frightened, and mountains being brought low. I have never seen a landslide, but I've seen the aftermath, where a mountain is just cut in two and is brought low, filling the valley with all this rubble. You can imagine the noise and the commotion when that mountain came crashing down. Last night we had an unfortunate incident where part of our retaining wall keeping us and the river separate, it crashed down about midnight with those heavy, heavy rains last night. I've stood on that wall to look up the river and I'm really glad I wasn't standing on the wall last night when it went hurling into the, into the river. But the strongholds will be brought low by the power of God. The place was shaken by the Holy Spirit. The place was shaken because they were a community of faith, a community of prayer, a community of the Word of God. And God affirmed and God confirmed what He was doing in their midst. Hallelujah. And says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit afresh. They'd been filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but God was doing something special, and they knew the power of God by the Holy Spirit that day. Where do we go? Do we come to the community? I hope we do. And I hope that we're building a community here where we trust one another, where we can pray for one another, where we can support one another. And when we hear the news of what's going on in each other's lives, it's not about advice, you should do this, you shouldn't have done that, and everything else, but we embrace one another and say, let's pray. We can pray outside on the veranda, on the sidewalks, we can pray outside of cars, we can pray in those cars, but we need to be that community of people of prayer, recognizing God's sovereignty, recognizing His knowledge, and recognizing His power. And when we ask, it's not all about us, but we're saying, God, use me. Give me boldness, give me power to preach your word, to share your word, to speak your words. And Lord, show your wonders, show your power. It may be very different from the book of Acts, but show your power, confirming your words. And my friends, my brothers, my sisters, when we get together and we pray and we pray together, it equals power 
in the Holy Spirit. Do you want power? It's not a one-off Pentecost Day power, but it's power for everyday living, and it's power for everyday living for Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you expecting power? Are you expecting a shaking? Amen. Get ready. Your shaking may come this week. Be ready for it. And when the shaking comes and someone says, oh, what happened? Oh, sorry for that. Say, no, 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 don't be sorry. That was God doing the shaking. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the example that we see in Peter and John. We thank you for the example we see in the community there, the very beginning of the church on this earth, where Peter and John went back to community, went back to church, and together they prayed, and they came to you recognizing your rule, your sovereignty, your knowledge, and your power, and they came with requests not just for themselves and not for comfort, but they came with a request for boldness to preach your word. And Lord, just like that church of old, we pray, O oh God, we want to see your wonders. Not to just be excited, but Lord, we want to see you in your power, working in the lives of men and women across this city and across this nation and around the world. We want to see your working, your wonder, confirming your word at work in their lives. And Lord, help us to be that people of prayer people of prayer, that we come boldly in prayer. And Lord, the result will be that power that we will see, the power of your Holy Spirit moving. And whether that shaking is an earthly shaking, whether this building will shake, or whether it is just us being shaken to our core, Lord, we pray that you would shake us, awaken us, and empower us by your Holy Spirit to be faithful to your word, and Lord, to proclaim the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. We pray in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.